Hello to the urologist everywhere and welcome to the electronic urology teaching course. My name is Mohammed Nuruddin. I'm a urology specialist in Hampshire hospitals and I'm an assistant lecturer of urology in Ain Shams University in Egypt. In this talk in our um, electronic urology course, I will discuss with you a very crucial topic in the clinical life and one of the hottest table in the FRCS Viva exam, which is the testicular cancer. In this talk, we'll speak about some background knowledge about testicular cancer, some technical points of really debatable issues. We'll go to the definition of the clinical stages and we'll discuss the treatment option of each stage. I will start with the background knowledge. And actually, this is a really hot area in the FRCS MCQ exam. So, the testicular cancer represents 1% of all the men neoplasia and it is considered the most curable cancer. Its incidence in the last decade has been rising up and this is due to the self-check programs and the increased awareness of it. However, its mortality specific rates are declining on the other side due to the big revolution of the chemotherapy agent used in the management of the testicular cancer. As about the risk factors, having a history of cryptorchidism increases the risk of testicular cancer of six folds in comparison to the normal population. And also, it is more common in the Scandinavian population. A man with a family history of testicular cancer is of four times more risk to get testicular cancer than the other population. And the infertile testes are found to have 1.5 times more risk to develop cancer than the normal testicles. And this is the Sweden paper about the undescended testes by Peterson that you may be asked to size in the VITA exam, which show the difference between the risk of to develop testicular cancer if the orchidopexy was done before and after the age of 13 years old. And we all know this classification. We classify testicular cancer into primary, secondary, and paratesticular neoplasia. The primary ones which we will speak about today is the germ cells and the non-germ cell tumors. The germ cells is either seminoma or non-seminoma, including the teratoma, choriocarcinoma, and imperiolar carcinoma. Once any patient is referred with a suspected testicular cancer, Relevant history should be taken to exclude any history of trauma, infection. All the risk factors that we have discussed should be explored in the history taken. Then a focused examination to the genital area should be done. If it is concerning, so the next step should be an urgent scrotal ultrasound. And there is some point that you need to know about the sticker ultrasound that it's a really high sensitivity to detect areas of suspected cancer. And any hypoechoic area inside the testicle should be concerning, especially if it's hypervascularized. And it could detect also the microlysiasis, which we'll speak about it in a second. Staging CT, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis should be arranged to check for retroperitoneal, visceral, and pulmonary metastasis. CT brain may be required in some cases which specifically have a multiple lung mets, or in some cases with the non-germ cell tumor with a really high elevated tumor markers. The tumor markers that we're speaking about are the alpha fetoprotein, the beta-HCG, and LDH. They are usually having some variation with a different testicular cancer. For example, the alpha fetoprotein is elevated in 50 to 70% of the non-germ cell tumor, or the non-seminoma germ cell tumor. And the beta HCG is usually high in 40 to 60 percent of the non seminoma germ cell tumors, and 30 percent of the seminoma will have some elevated markers, but the rest will not have any rise in the tumor markers. These markers are usually measured at the presentation five to seven days after the radical orchidectomy, and typically three to four times per year for the first one of three years and therefore they are really helpful parameter in the follow-up if they were elevated before the operation or in the case of recurrences. PET scans are not of a big use in a testicular cancer initial staging however it plays a really important role in the post chemotherapy residual retroperitoneal lymph nodes in the seminoma cases especially. And we will discuss about that in the management, 
But the PET scan is one of the good investigation that will be able to differentiate between the scar formation, viable cancer, or the presence of any other form of cancer like the mature teratoma. And let's go for these some technical issues. There are some debatable points that need to be addressed. And these points you will usually face in every testicular cancer life case in your career. And it will be usually a big twist in your FRCS testicular cancer viva table. So, semen banking. It should be offered to all men who are still aiming to complete the family before the orchidectomy. And you should be able to cite the Peterson paper, which is stated that 9% of the patient with oligospermia will be azospermic after orchidectomy. The other point, would you offer procedure the same session with orchidectomy or after? Robinson showed that there is no difference between the procedure's insertion at the time of the orchidectomy and after that in the readmission rate, theater return, and the infection rate. So better to have it done at the same time. And then, when would you counsel a patient for a contralateral testicular biopsy? You need to know that the testicular intraepithelium neoplasia is a precursor lesion for most of the testicular germ cell tumors. It presents in the contralateral testes of the testicular cancer in 9% of the patients. But the 5-year risk to develop a testicular cancer from a TIN is 50%, and this as per Dickman. However, biopsy of the contralateral testes should be offered only to the high-risk patients, which include testicular volume less than 12 mils, history of cryptorchidism, and poor spermatogenesis. Microlithiasis. You will be asked a question like that, you will get a picture of that, and then you will ask you what can you see in this image? And then when you say that's a microlithiasis, you say, so what do you mean by microlithiasis? So you need to know that not every calcification will be considered as a microlithiasis. It is the presence of five or more calcification in a field of view. And its management depends on the risk factor too. So for example, in patients with risk factor, the evidence from 10 systematic review goes that they should have a testicular biopsy. Otherwise, if they are not of any risk factors, we usually reassure them and ask them to keep on a self-examination and then you could discharge them actually. This will be a really debatable point. In the orchidectomy, do we need to tie the cord high in the inguinal canal or low as a sub-inguinal approach? So Ashdown looked in, in that in almost 200 patients. They are all in a stage one testicular cancer, and they found that there is no difference in the recurrence rate and the metastasis, which is a really interesting finding. But that's not the standard of care. So the standard of care that the cord should be tied as high as the internal ring as possible, and this for the radicality issues. Then moving to the management, we should be aware of the clinical staging of testicular cancer. The TNN is a no mistake land for any clinician or urologist taking the exam. So you should know it by heart. What I would just need to say here in the end staging, it is dependent on testicular cancer on the size of the regional lymph nodes, while any non regional lymph node is considered as an M1A. But the management is more reliable on the AGCC cancer staging, which groups any T with N node M node in a stage one, while any T with any N with M node as a stage two. And the presence of any M will be a stage three. And there is a big difference in the prognosis and the treatment options available for each one of these stages, which we will show. And another important point, while you are offering the treatment option, the prognostics factors should guide us on how to select between the more and the less aggressive options. For example, in the seminoma, there is an intermediate prognostic risk group, which is a presence of the non-pulmonary visceral metastasis. And the management of this group will be completely different from the good prognostic one. While the non-seminoma germ cell tumor it has a poor prognostic risk group, which is the presence of the mediastinal primary 
or a very high tumor markers. For a stage 1 seminoma, there is multiple trials such as a Spanish study or the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer trial and the all show that after a colectomy patient could be offered surveillance but the risk for relapse is around 10% while if the patient had a one cycle of carboplatin adjuvant chemotherapy, the risk is up to 2%. So in these cases, we usually counsel the patient according to the pathological prognostic factor, which is the tumor size and the invasion of the ready testis. So if they are at low risk, they can have the surveillance, but if they are at high risk, the chemotherapy should be offered. So that is the plan. Here will be adjuvant chemotherapy or surveillance. The radiotherapy, to be honest, is an obsolete in the UK for this stage due to its high side effects. And after that, in case of any relapse at any further future staging, chemotherapy cycles should be offered. And this is the same recommendation from the European guidelines. In the stage 1 non seminoma patient, the Zwanantika study showed that the relapse rate is much lower in the adjuvant combination chemotherapy well, it is very high with the surveillance only. Some patients may not be compliant with the chemotherapy, so the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection may be offered as an option, but with high consideration of its multiple morbidities, as you see here. So the plan for this group is to offer chemotherapy. If they are non-compliant and a good prognosis, they could be offered surveillance. But if they are bad prognosis and they can't have the chemotherapy, then they should be offered nerve spaling retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. And also the prognostic pathological risk factor should help in this decision, like the proliferation rate and the lymphovascular invasion. And these are European guidelines, and as you can see here, the low and the high risk differentiation offering the treatment options is really important. In stage 2 seminoma patient, there is no much randomized controlled trial between the chemo and the radiotherapy. However, due to the side effect of the radiotherapy, the chemotherapy will be usually the preferred option. So the patient, according to European guidelines, they are usually offered three cycles of PEP or four cycles of EP only if the pleomycin is contraindicated due to poor kidney function or history of parenchymal lung disease. In the non seminoma patient, there is a slight difference. If they have a tumor marker which was raised before the orchidectomy and still high after that, they should straightforward have three cycles of PEP. If the tumor markers drop to a negative value or they were negative before the procedure, at that time they should be offered a follow up for at least six weeks and then to assess again the lymph node. If it regressed, that's fine, they could just be followed up. But if it is progressed at that time, they should have um, chemotherapy or they could have the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. The stage 3 or the metastatic group, that is the really poor area that have no randomized controlled trials, but most of them will be offered at least four cycles of PEP and then managed accordingly. In the cases of the post chemotherapy residual retroperitoneal lymph nodes, in the seminoma cases, if, if it is less than 3 cm, it should be followed up, as it will be most probably just a fibrotic scar in more than 90% of the cases. However, if it is more than 3 cm, this is a place where the FDG PET scan can differentiate between the active cancer or the scar or the presence of a mature teratoma. And then according to that, further chemotherapy or resection, or in some cases radiotherapy may be offered. In the non-seminoma germ cell tumors, any residual mass more than one centimeter should be offered resection. And that's it. And I hope this rapid review of this topic will be helpful to you. And thanks for your attention. Feel free to send any question on this email and I will answer it once possible. I will be really, really grateful if you can fill this feedback, which will help me to improve this session, provided the comment that you will submit. Thanks a lot, and best wishes. Mohammed.